Good evening, all. Welcome back to Introduction to Philosophy. Tonight, we are discussing Charles Darwin and Karl Marx. Uh, Darwin probably needs no introduction to us. Well, neither of these guys likely do. Uh, but Darwin revolutionized modern thought, and his influence now stretches across outside of biology and zoology to the humanities, the social sciences, genetics, ethics, political theory. Uh, really, he's been massively influential. Now, as a result of this Darwinian perspective in things, our problems of knowledge, conduct, and governance are changing from being abstract principles to now about how we adapt to environmental pressures. And so Darwin's coming out of this enlightenment context and really is going to take that idea that we saw in Hegel with his Sturm und Drang uh, and promote progress through conflict. So let's talk a little bit about his early life. He was born in Shrewsbury in 1809. His father was a doctor uh, and he was, uh, the doctor father was married to the daughter of De Josiah Wedgwood, the porcelain family. So plenty of money, went to Edinburgh, was gonna study medicine, uh, then moved to Cambridge, was gonna study ministry. But there he met a guy named John Henslow who got him interested in biology. And he also took field trips with the geologist Adam Sedgwick. Encouraged by Henslow, Darwin got a job as the ship naturalist on the Beagle uh, from 1831 to 1836. And during this five year voyage was able to collect thousands of samples of flora and fauna from all over the place. Uh, perhaps his most famous place was from the Galapagos Islands uh, off the coast of South America that you've no doubt heard of. Uh, and he comes back with a mind really sharply focused on this stuff. Now his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, I had theorized that all varieties of living things had at one point originated from a single type. Darwin is going to kind of take up that whole idea. Others had written about the plan of nature, the order of nature, that's our telos that we've discussed, but Darwin is giving us a teleological theory about ends, but one without, a, so a plan-based idea, but without a planner. In other words, without a god. So Darwin publishes The Origin of Species in 1859, and it really didn't meet as much controversy as has been presented in a lot of the, uh, the movies and pages. In fact, most re reviews of it were very, very positive. 11 years later, though, he published The Scent of Man, and that was a really different reception. There's kind of an argumentative tone when you read The Scent of Man, and he's making a pretty big inductive leap to say that we essentially uh, came from monkeys, but you know, it is what it is. There's not a whole lot of room for qualifying the radical implications of Darwinian thought. So what we've got is this very evolutionary psychology where human nature is not separated in any fundamental or meaningful way from the rest of nature. Now, part of this has to do with a guy named Charles Lyell who wrote The Principles of Geology. What happens is this gives a time frame that's compatible with the requirements of Darwin's theory. Up until now, most people had worked under the assumption, and some people still do, that the world's only about 6,000 years old. Now, where do they get that from? They're getting that largely from a book called The Annals of the World, written by Archbishop James Usher of Ireland uh, a couple of centuries ago. Usher had access to a lot of the sources that we don't have anymore, uh, and basically what he did is he did a genealogical trip through through the Bible and took the ages of everybody from Adam onward, and added them all up and concluded that the world had begun on October the 20th, uh, 4,004 4, BC at 6 p.m. Why 6 p.m.? Well, in Genesis, there is evening, there is morning the first day. So the, night, the day starts the previous night. Uh, why October 20th? Well, that's roughly the date of Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the Jewish year, 4,004 BC. That's where he calculated everybody all the way back. So, uh, modern young earth creationists keep with that, but what Lyle had proposed was basically that no, the world is millions, more likely billions of years old, uh, for all these geological time things to take place. Lyle gives a uniformitarian theory. Basically what that means is that the geological processes that were operating back in the remote past are probably still operating today, and there's enough time in that history for evolution to work. So Lyle had proposed, looking at the fossil record, uh, that some older species had died out and been replaced by those that were more fit. Okay. Now, some of Darwin's critics, kind of as late as the second half of the 19th century, said, well, he really hadn't followed good scientific design, and he kind of didn't. Uh, he's really not following Bacon and Newton, 
Uh, he's not following that step-by-step -step inductive process. Even on our own time, uh, scientists have said, look, this natural election, selection account is kind of far-fetched because you know, a beaver can't imagine himself being a chainsaw and make his process any quicker. So for a scientific theory to be good, um, it has to be both retrodictive in that it explains how things to came, came to be the way that they are, but also predictive. So if we're talking about gravity, for instance, every time I have fallen, it's been at a rate of 32 feet per second squared. Every time I ever will fall, it'll be at a rate of 32 feet per second squared. Evolutionary though, evolutionary theory does succeed in being retrodictive. It does explain how we might have ended up the way that we do, but it failed at being predictive. In other words, it doesn't tell us what cool X-Men powers that we're going to develop on a long enough evolutionary timeline. So Darwin himself kind of acknowledges this. He says this is a kind of natural history. Some also argued that the fossil record, which Darwin insists was incomplete, is actually too good to show evolution of species. Um, it didn't show the minute progression and gradual change of these newest species as the theory kind of requires. Uh, Alfred w Russell Wallace, who's one of the most influential people you've probably never heard of, uh, is the co-discoverer of this theory. And he's a distinguished scholar in his own right, even though we've kind of lost him to memory. But uh, he says, well, the problem is, is that the record is complete, but it's not an accurate record. Uh, it's got a broken, shifted, poorly stratified record. If I were to take out the novel War and Peace, which is a pretty big book, and tear individual chapters out, replacing the numbers and shift them up and give it to you and ask you to make sense of it, honestly, with War and Peace, it probably wouldn't change the plot a whole hell of a lot. But the idea is, is we're seeing things, according to Wallace, out of the order in which they were recorded. So a lot of people pointed out especially that farmers and breeders have been selectively breeding livestock and domestic animals for thousands of years. Uh, you know, we domestic, or rather we breed the Wagyu cattle to have more marbling in their meat and shorter legs. We breed hogs to have more uh, intramuscular fat. Uh, we breed chickens to lay bigger eggs or develop bigger breasts or what have you. And yet through doing all of this, we've come up with new breeds, but never in new species. More significant for most was this idea uh, kind of that we saw before is that nature has its own creative renewing forces uh, that don't seem to have a plan, design, or attention. Evolutionary theory doesn't give this peaceable theory of a providential God, but kind of this place of competition and conflict. So Herbert Spencer, who, if you Google him, looks a lot like Dr. Zayas from Planet of the Apes, he's the guy that actually originally used Survival of the Fittest eight years before Origin of Species was published. What this kind of gives is this libertarian approach to social Darwinism that Spencer had advocated. Uh, basically, this idea that if moral progress de depends on the achievements of the best and the brightest in each social group, they shouldn't be held back, kind of waiting for the middle. For the less talented. Another implication of this theory is that what matters are collectives, not so much individuals. And as you can, might expect, Karl Marx, who we're talking about next, is going to pick up this on this in a big, big way. Uh, Francis Galton, who was actually Darwin's cousin, was writing about hereditary genius in the 1860s. And he said, you know, if we take a large sample of human beings, let's say, I don't know, 100,000, there's really a negligibly small number of truly exceptional individuals in that group, but the entire race depends on the achievements of that comparably small group. So we're maybe holding on for two, three, four really, really smart people to come out of that and make a difference. Galton himself was really kind of committed to this idea. He had uh, actually said, look, we've got to improve society from a genetic means, and maybe we could give some cash to people if they voluntarily sterilize themselves if they're stupid. I don't know. Now, if nature can kind of prune and purify the human and other species at the level of intellect, it can also select our moral dispositions if they enhance our adaptive potential. So in this way, ethics kind of boils down almost to biology. There's room for altruism that is doing good things for the good things on sake, uh, but it's kind of defined biologically. It's the behavior of individuals that favor the survival of the whole species. Uh, Darwin's proponent, Thomas Henry Huxley, wondered, could natural selection ever really match up with human moral conceptions? Alfred Russell Wallace, again, one of the most influential people we've mostly never heard about, uh, ultimately asked, could the theory of natural selection succeed to explain our unique human nature? And he says, look, there's three things that we do 
uh, that distinctly remove us from this idea and really can't be assimilated by it. First is purely abstract thought. Uh, so I'm reading a novel right now that is very, very loosely based in fiction, and it doesn't really serve any evolutionary end. It's not making me more fit for my environment. It's just entertaining me. Also, we've got the domain of aesthetics. Let's see, you can see a painting back there, and there's a map over there, and there's a couple other paintings behind me. Um, we make things pretty for pretty's own sake. Now you could say, but there's beauty in nature, and yes, there is, but when the bird of paradise opens its tail plumage, or when the bees build a beautiful piece of honeycomb, they're doing that as a part of their function, uh, as part of fecundity, not so much just to make it pretty. Also, we've got this whole thing of moral thought and ethics. We can actually sacrifice our most cherished interests for the benefit of other people. And if we're really in competition with one another, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be trying to trip them up at every turn. So the Darwinian theory, it meets with opposition, but it rapidly becomes uh, universally successful as both a description and as a method. So we might ask, can this kind of theory tell us in any way how we're supposed to live? Yet in this radically Darwinian world, it doesn't seem like we could be non-Darwinian and especially not anti-Darwinian in our thought. So where does this leave us? Well, it leaves us kind of on the doorstep of Karl Marx. And so let's talk about him. It's really difficult to have a neutral, not balanced perspective on Karl Marx and Marxism. Because a lot of the second half of the 20th century politically is associated with Marxism. And we're probably either giving him too much credit or scorning him a bit too much. A lot of what comes down to us as actual Marxism uh, really isn't Marxism. It's the fault of Mao Zedong, uh, V.I. Lenin, and Joseph Stalin. Uh, and these characters, it really doesn't match up with Marx's own theories. Uh, Marx said, look, I'm not a philosopher. Now, he actually was by training. His doctoral dissertation was on uh, Democritus of Abdera, but he thought philosophical speculation just didn't have a whole lot of use in things. He really was more interested in social revolution, which is probably what we associate with him with most now. Marx regarded himself as a social scientist, making contributions primarily through economic and social theory. So the way Marx thinks of himself is that he's really not doing a whole lot in terms of drawing from this uh, philosophy, but he thinks of himself as drawing from sciences. Uh, now, whatever Marx thought he was doing, his principal contributions uh, really have a lot of impact on the history of the great ideas. So he was born in Prussia, a middle-class family, uh, Jewish, had had a long line of rabbis that his father, who does not become a rabbi and actually becomes a lawyer, says, guess what, kids? Now we are all Lutherans because Prussia was already starting to be kind of anti-Semitic in this time. Now, what this does to Marx is it tells him, well, if religion can be changed that quickly, that easily, and for what are largely economic reasons, religion must not be particularly important. Uh, so he attends Bonn University. He becomes engaged to a daughter of the aristocracy, a gal named Jenny von Westphalen. Uh, studies at the University of Berlin, where he's interested in Hegel. At age 26, he gets his first and only job as the editor of a revolutionary newspaper, or rather he makes it revolutionary and gets promptly fired. Uh, so he gets kicked out of a lot of the countries in Europe, finally settles in London. He's buried in Highgate Cemetery, and you can go and visit his tomb if you like. In his writings, we kind of feel his impatience with a lot of the stuff that we deal with in philosophy. As a scientist, whether we're talking about social or otherwise, uh, he doesn't contribute a whole lot compared to the influence that he would later have, particularly after his death. So he's kind of a non-philosopher because he doesn't pay a lot of attention to the problems or the systematic philosophies that is what we've called the long debate uh, that we deal with. So in amongst all of these revolutions in the 1840s, uh, Marx gets interested in Gassendi's atomistic material solution. Uh, remember, the atomist said that, look, the natural world consists of two fundamental parts, invisible atoms and the empty void. Um, so Marx is a materialist, but not a Democritian or mechanistic Gassendian one. He's a Hegelian one, and that involves his dialectic. Okay? So if we're trying to classify Marx as a materialist, it would be as a dialectical materialist, which is what he is sometimes also called. Kind of how this works is through a struggle of opposites. Remember, change comes through conflicts. So the class struggle 
is kind of the engine of progress through history. Uh, if we look at our thesis, antithesis, synthesis, the thesis is we've got feudal lords. The antithesis to them are serfs and peasants. The synthesis is city life, people moving off the manors. The antithesis is you get the guilds forming to say, hey, we control the leather dyeing, we control the goldsmithing, and so on and so forth. The synthesis uh, is entrepreneurs. People who say, look, I'm not in the guild, I'm just gonna pay you to do this. The antithesis of that becomes the proletariat, the synthesis of which Marx hoped, and it didn't, was the ideal equal classless society, which really we can't have, that's for another discussion. So as a social scientist, Marx thinks all these determinative laws are operating at the level of society throughout history. This is materialistic, not mechanistic, and usually works, or at least most visibly, through economic forces. So the Darwinian model, remember, this is a source of inspiration for Marx. Uh, Marx dedicated Das Kapital to Darwin, and we don't know what Darwin must have thought about that. Uh, he probably wasn't particularly impressed. What Marx is doing in proposing that economics imposes change on societies and people, he's reversing the traditional way of looking at how systems and institutions tend to come about within civilizations. For example, Aristotle said, look, you get a political and a legal framework within society, and that shapes the moral character of its citizens. Marx turns that around. Okay? So every society depends on the forces of production. You gotta make enough food, you gotta make enough clothing, you gotta make enough shelter, gonna make enough weapons, all that kind of stuff. So we start with these productive forces and the laboring class becomes the instrument through which this production becomes possible. Now, after a while, you get possession of property and this gives class distinctions between laborers and property owners. And so the property class has to come up with some way to make sure that the laborers stay in their place. And so that class writes the laws, they exact the punishments, and for the Marxist, law is a class concept and a class tool, keeping these material interdependencies going between what he calls the bourgeois and the proletarian classes. Okay? The reaction to unionization in the 19th century is the kind of idea that Marx would have said, look, see, it shows. Okay? Because remember that capitalism, and we're not out to critique capitalism necessarily, but just to understand it, depends on selling products for more than they cost to produce. When you buy your iPhone, you are not paying that much for the metal, the glass, the silica, and whatever else is in there. The cost is chiefly labor, and whatever surplus is profit. That profit then accumulates as capital. Uh, this is what Marx would have called a labor theory of value. Feudalism hadn't had these problems, because social class and feudalism really wasn't a measure of your personal worth. It was just where you belonged in society, whether as a villager, a knight, a baron, a king, whatever. Capitalism, though, has to grow in order to survive. We're going to meet your basic needs, yes, but then we're going to create artificial desires in you. Do you need the latest and greatest iPhone? Probably not. Do you need the latest and greatest Nikes? Probably not. Do you want those things nonetheless? Well, of course you do. Why wouldn't you? So this consumer society gets created, and then it gets enlarged. And Marx says only through a revolt of the laboring class can such a system be destroyed. And those in control of the means of production also control and define the consciousness of those oppressed. So the model for this, Marx says, is religion. He calls it the opiate of the masses. Opium is a soporific. It makes you sleepy. It kind of deadens your senses. And he says religion's always handed down from upper to lower classes. If we look at most religions, um, they are kind of a pyramid sort of thing. Not a pyramid scheme, but a pyramid. So if we look, for instance, at the Roman Catholic Church, we've got a single pope at the top. We got a handful of cardinals, little larger group of archbishops, larger group of bishops, much larger groups of priests, much, much, much larger groups of deacons, and then a whole bunch of lay people. Kind of flows down from the top, okay? This class consciousness is part of this class struggle that Marxists are so interested in. And so that becomes the necessary engine of revolutionary change and progress. Excuse me. The first thing the worker has to realize, says Marx, is that they're being exploited, they're being manipulated. Probably hyperbole, but kind of depends on your work experience. Their success is going to defend, or depend largely on those who own the work failing. And likewise, Marx says, the folks who own the means of production need the failure of the worker in order to keep this whole machine going. So what you need is revolutionary change, and that's probably not gonna be bloodless, so here Marx is giving a little nod to violence, because those in power aren't gonna willingly relinquish it. Power has to be taken from them. 
And so you've got these revolutionary upheavals. They're the only basis that economic social status can be changed uh, and forced to change. Now, in the ordinary run of things, especially in our modern world, science and technology are really the only things that radically alter the means of production. So we've got changes in productive resources because science and technology gets better. Uh, instead of trying to plow the fields with a single person working a hoe, we get a plow. Then we make that plow metal and it's more effective. Then we get a combine harvester. Now we've got tractors and all these things. So workers might now require greater technical skills. They might require more education, but the class consciousness thing kind of kind of sits in there and distracts everybody. Now, Marxist theory really doesn't leave any room for revolutionary changes affected by technology and science. Uh, science. It's a deterministic theory, which is defeated by actual people living real lives on their own terms outside of mother's basement. In practice, it doesn't explain, it fails to achieve what its defenders promise in theory. Uh, but its altered perspectives in an enduring way remains in the background of kind of constructionist theories of personality, personal identity, class consciousness, and the whole nine yards. And that's really why we need to understand what Marxism is, uh, just so we kind of see what it is that we're dealing with. Does Marxism fundamentally work? Absolutely not. Uh, does socialism work? Not in a million years. Uh, we've actually had a little over 100 years to test it, and it fails completely. Uh, does communism work? Well, of course not. Not on any kind of large scale, see previous comment. So we look at this stuff kind of to give us the context within which a lot of this operates. And that's sort of what sets the tone for where we're going next. As always, if you've got questions or comments, leave them in the comments below or post them to the discussion page. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.